I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year. Do you remember the king broadcasting those words? It was a year ago, the beginning of 1940. It was the gate to a most amazing year of history through which he and his peoples have passed. As 1940 ends, we look back on a year of anxiety and anguish, but also one of triumph over unimagined adversity. In the days of that prolonged winter, which was kept so secret, we practiced ARP in the snow, hardly believing then in the importance of what we were doing. But when the time of testing came, how valuable that long period of rehearsal proved. In France, the French army manned the Maginot Line and waited. Impatient by nature, the Frenchman persuaded himself that Hitler never meant to attack. Said Hitler, the French army rutted on its feet. That may or may not be true. Then suddenly on April the 10th, the first blow was struck. Hitler occupied Denmark and invaded Norway. The Scandinavian countries who had made a creed of neutrality found themselves overrun by the Nazi aggressor without even a declaration of war. Norway, with British aid, put up a stout resistance despite traitors and unpreparedness, but the German aeroplanes operating from captured aerodromes turned the scale. And as more momentous prospects loomed on the horizon, the Allies withdrew from their footholds on the northern coasts. The short war in Norway led to the fall of Mr. Chamberlain. We know now how gallantly the ex-premier must have struggled against ill health. He is numbered among the great men whose passing we mourn this year. On May the 10th, memorable date, it was the turn of the Low Countries. Accused of unneutral conduct by the great aggressor, Holland's resistance was overcome in less than a week. Queen Wilhelmina escaped to England. The British and French armies moved up into Belgium, and we all had visions, let's admit it, of a repetition of trench warfare in France and Flanders. It was not to be. The Germans struck at the hinge in the French line and created a bulge. The bulge became a gap employing the savage technique of indiscriminately blasting cities from the air they drove civilians before them to cause confusion in the allies lines they broke through to the channel coast and when king leopold of the belgians surrendered his army the bef was encircled of that heroic withdrawal through dunkirk what is there to be said more powerful than these pictures 330,000 men returned home safely to the immense joy and relief of their countrymen if the mercy of dunkirk exceeded our remotest hopes the collapse of France exceeded our wildest misgivings. Premier Renault was eased out of his position so that Marshal Pétain and General Végon might make terms with Hitler. The Parliament of the Third Republic met at Vichy to vote itself out of existence and the new French government signed an armistice with Germany. Only General de Gaulle and a remnant of gallant Frenchmen elected to carry on the struggle beside Britain. At this crisis in our history, when the possibility of invasion seemed very near, the Home Guard was born. A million and a half volunteers were enrolled to stand guard against parachutists and fifth columnists, while regular troops prepared to defend the beaches. I suppose we shall always remember the emotions of June and July this year, when it seemed that any day we might be assailed by the Nazi hordes and the soil of Britain become the new scene of conflict for our battalion. Instead of invasion came bombardment from the air. The first brunt fell upon shipping and convoys, and many were the heroic battles fought over Dover and the southeast coast. Then on September the 7th began the Battle of London. Wave after wave of German bombers crossed the few miles of channel to rain daylight havoc on the capital. Our Spitfires and Hurricanes broke them up and smashed them down. Goering had miscalculated the strength of the RAF. As Mr. Churchill said, never in the field of human conflict has so much been owed by so many to so few. And the exploits of the Royal Air Force in September 1940 will ring down the ages. Of course, London suffered, and the night attacks which followed the failure of the daylight raids have added to the havoc. But the indomitable spirit of the Londoner has surmounted all that. The same is true of Merseyside and of other centres on which Hitler has concentrated his hate, including Coventry. 
This substantial industrial city was selected for a special blitzkrieg of its own. The spite of the enemy thwarted over London was visited indiscriminately on a smaller community. A year ago, the extent to which mastery of the air would dominate this war was hardly imagined. Now we begin to understand. When British bombers carry deep into Germany the missiles which cripple Hitler's war industries, we are striking blows at the heart which would be impossible to our land and sea forces without the reconquest of lands now overrun by Germany. On the success of these bombers, a large part of victory may depend. And to the success of these bombers, industry contributes a full half share. Hence, aircraft production occupies a special key position in the scheme of victory. We see why the Minister of Aircraft Production is a member of the War Cabinet. We see why the hours of skilled labor must be unremitting. Victory depends on it. For the same reason, our gratitude goes out to the United States, where 50% of their aircraft manufacture has been switched to making planes for Britain. This was the decision of President Roosevelt, who has broken precedent by securing election for a third term. American support has taken many forms, not least of them the exchange of overage destroyers for bases in the West Indies. A page of history was written in this deal, which will remain important long after the war becomes a memory. We have recalled events on land, in the air, on the home front. There remains the war at sea. Another great part of victory depends on Britannia ruling the waves. Italy's entry into the war, the loss of the Allied French fleet, these put a new complexion on the naval situation. But no section of the British people rose to the occasion more magnificently than our seamen. Painful duty was performed at Oran, where France's battle fleet had to be rendered valueless to the Germans. And the Eastern Mediterranean fleet began a series of actions against the numerically superior Italian Navy, which were reminiscent of the halcyon days of our great admirals. When Mussolini declared war on Greece, and when little Greece smacked back at him, new opportunities were given to Admiral Cunningham and his men. At Toronto, the dreams of the Duce were shattered by the fleet air arm. Then came the tremendous victory in the Western Desert when the British Army of the Nile broke and conquered Mussolini's Libyan Legion. A brilliant action in which the Navy cooperated, one which was made possible by the ability to reinforce conferred by sea power. But it's not only in the big actions, but in the routine duties that the Navy and Mercantile Marine carries the nation's burdens. The Navy blockades a Nazi-dominated Europe. The Mercantile Marine braves the Nazi submarines, mines and U-boats that Britain may herself survive. We honor the spirit of the men who sail in the convoys and bring us food and weapons and war materials. It is the same spirit which has actuated our seamen since the beginning of the war. It is the spirit which beat the Graf Spee. The spirit which rescued the prisoners of the Altmark, which steamed into Narvik Fjord. It's the spirit of the Jarvis Bay and the submarine service. It's derived from a long tradition of freedom-loving yet disciplined men, inspired every now and then by new examples of self-sacrifice and devotion to duty. In this war, the Navy has undoubtedly benefited by the early leadership of Mr. Churchill, the man to whom the nation turned in its hour of greatest peril. If we look forward to the turn of the tide in 1941, as indeed we do, it is because we have confidence in ourselves, our men, and our leadership. So roll on 1941.